everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is the fifth event of this sustainability lecture and dialogue series. Sustainability addresses the interconnectedness of the environment, social equity, economy, and aesthetics. There are many challenges at this intersection of these spheres. One such challenge is housing. Today's theme is social and environmental justice addressing housing and community disparities in Greensboro. And we will hear from Dr. Stephen Sills. Dr. Sills is Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for Housing and Community Studies. For the last 14 years, Dr. Stephen Sills has conducted housing and community-based research in North Carolina. He has served as the investigator, evaluator, and consultant on over 100 applied and community-engaged projects. His projects often employ community-based participatory research frameworks to leverage local resources to empower residents. He has served, uh, he has received many grants over the years. I learned today that over uh, 45, 45 funded projects are currently in progress. That's really extremely <laughs> impressive. Most recently, he was awarded a fellowship and grant for the Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Program of the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation for an environmental justice project in East Greensboro. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Seals. There we go, thank you so much. Um, for that introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to be going through um, at the root causes of inequality um, as uh, they're framed in Greensboro specifically. Um, you'll see that some of these causes are universal and they're issues that we've been talking about um, for the past eight or nine months during COVID uh, impacting many of the members of our community but they're rooted in issues uh, more than 100 years old, policies that have created uh, inequitable and disparate outcomes. Um, I'll talk about how these policies have resulted in concentrations of poverty, specifically in East and Southeast Greensboro. I'll talk about how that poverty and lack of wealth building over the past century has resulted in um, reliance on rental housing in those neighbor neighborhoods and how that rental housing is now unaffordable uh, to many members of the community. Um, I'll then talk about um, four, five projects that the center is currently engaged in to address some of these social and environmental uh, injustices. Um, and as uh, Sean uh, mentioned, uh, put questions in the chat. I, I will try to monitor that at the same time on, on a single screen for, for this presentation. Uh, so I'll try to keep an eye for that um, pop-up box uh, in case you have any questions. So we're going to talk just a little bit about root causes, uh, segregation, redlining, and the racist planning practices of the last century or so. Or so. And I see that Shoney's coming in with us here too. Um, there we go. Um, has anybody read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein? This is a great book. Yes. Good book that um, really frames this issue. And it talks about how this isn't just a localized issue in the South. It's not something just an East Coast uh, issue, but an issue that is universal to uh, the United States. Uh, the policies of the 20th century are still plaguing us today. They've created um, bifurcated cities like Greensboro, where we have uh, people of color, uh, people of uh, uh, um, poverty, people in poverty, segregated to particular uh, sections of the city historically and, uh, and continuing uh, uh, those patterns uh, today. Uh, these were racially explicit policies. They were embedded in a, in, in a, in a racism that was by law and uh, structurally creating impediments for anyone within communities of color uh, to achieve what was uh, uh, on par with the white communities 
uh, in many places uh, just across town. Here's Greensboro today. This is uh, 2020 American Community Survey data. So it is the, the most recent census uh, data available. And we see that in neighborhoods in East Greensboro, this is at the block group level, so the neighborhood level, neighborhoods in East and Southeast Greensboro are 80% or more African-American alone. This means uh, someone is checking just to the box, Black or African-American on a census survey in, in these neighborhoods in East and Southeast Greensboro. This is the pattern that we saw in the 19, 20s, in the 1870s, and before. Uh, at those times, it was de jure uh, by law uh, that these neighborhoods were the only places that a person of color could live by racial covenant uh, and restrictions. Today, we still see that impact, de facto impact of racialized planning uh, playing out in the demographics of neighborhoods in East Greensboro. And I'll, I'll even add that some of these neighborhoods are 95% African-American or higher, um, while the, the, the map is showing us 80% or, or above. So we have a situation of uh, separation, segregation uh, occurring in Greensboro. The bifurcating lines are US 29 North, and east of that, Elm Eugene through downtown, and Market Street on, on kind of that south border uh, and south. Um, um, some places it might be um, Gate City Boulevard and south. We can see that there are neighborhoods to the north and west, starting with Irving Park and moving outwards, uh, kind of in a wedge shape. Uh, that are less than 15% white, uh, sorry, less than 15% African-American. Uh, these are majority white neighborhoods. So, so this pattern of, of segregating ourselves by color, by ethnicity, continues even 100 years after um, policies were struck down. Let's go back to 1937, Homeowners Loan Corporation. Uh, this corporation operated between 1933 and 1954, though uh, most of its lending was between uh, 1933 and 1940. Uh, originally uh, uh, a means to uh, put money out to help uh, struggling homeowners maintain their homes. Uh, this, this was the original Fannie Mae, um, the, the mortgage lender uh, for most of American homeowners uh, during this time period. And it segregated or um, uh, identified neighborhoods by risk. Green areas were uh, low risk, uh, high security areas. Uh, the bluish areas were second grade, yellow areas third grade, and red areas fourth grade. Red has become known as red lining. And we can see from a map of Greensboro that neighborhoods in South and Southeast Greensboro were redlined in the 1930s. This policy meant that even if you were a homeowner in that neighborhood, you couldn't get a mortgage through the Homeowners Loan Corporation or the banks that uh, they were working with. If I wanted to refinance a home, if I wanted to sell a home to another person who uh, would purchase with a mortgage, I was not likely to be able to uh, because of the redlining. This meant that housing in those neighborhoods became devalued. They had to be uh, accessible by cash and not by mortgages. So capital was very difficult to, to get. Hi. Hi. Hello? OK. Um, capital was very difficult to get. And one of the impacts was to, to suck equity out of the redlined areas. Um, also transferring many of the homeowner occupied homes to uh, investors who were speculating on those homes uh, as rental properties. Now, during this time we had 
um, mixed income neighborhoods in these same red areas, African-American neighborhoods that had uh, wealth, that had uh, business class, working class, um, uh, owners of capital, um, people who were on city council, uh, uh, physicians, et cetera, living together in these neighborhoods. So mixed income, mixed class, mixed education. Uh, that's a healthy market. Um, until this time, um, those markets were stable um, and, and um, there was a, a level of affluence. So if you drive through areas of East Greensboro, you see uh, some of the remaining uh, housing from the late 1800s and early 1900s where there was um, uh, some affluence uh, still in that, in that community. Much has been torn down uh, since. So according to this um, uh, very recent paper um, at the uh, Reserve Bank of Chicago, we see that the redlining has led to reduced home ownership rates, home uh, house values, uh, rental and increased racial segregation in decades after um, uh, the, the redlining. They've made comparisons to communities that did not have these uh, homeowners loan corporation maps and see uh, significant, statistically significant differences in the patterns uh, that have emerged in the century since. This is Greensboro 2018 data, where we uh, constructed a market segmentation for the city. Uh, and we, we started at the parcel level with quality of homes, a 54 item survey of the, of the quality of the um, structures on the parcels and combine that with uh, about 22 other measures of uh, market uh, stability. And we see that the neighborhoods in East Greensboro in 2018 were considered extremely weak markets relative to the rest of the neighborhoods uh, in Greensboro. Um, uh, the neighborhoods of Northwest Greensboro being the most stable. One of the underlying issues here is the wealth gap that has emerged between black and white communities in that century since uh, the homeowners loan corporation maps uh, came into existence. Uh, my grandparents owned a home. They were able to pass on at least part of that home ownership wealth to my parents who, were, who may at some point pass on uh, some wealth uh, to my generation. Um, over the course of the past four or five generations in the white community, even middle-class families have been able to accumulate uh, more wealth than African-American communities of similar uh, economic beginnings, similar educational uh, backgrounds, similar uh, workforce uh, uh, positions. In fact, on average, white families hold six and a half, almost seven times as much wealth as black families. Um, and we've, we've done a, a number of different regression analyses to see controlling for sizes of family, controlling for location, controlling for educational attainment, et cetera. And we still see the black white wealth gap uh, uh, playing out. One of the key elements there is uh, the lower rates of home ownership that are occurring within uh, Black communities. Uh, that last bullet by the Urban Institute really underscores uh, that, that um, wealth and parental support being passed on intergenerationally uh, is key in home ownership. Um, uh, Housing has become too expensive for young people in the family forming years of 25 to 35, often to afford without assistance from parents, uh, parents who have most likely paid off their mortgages by that point or are able to borrow against equity in their homes and assist um, uh, their, uh, their children. 
So let's talk a little bit about some of the impacts of the wealth gap and some of the impacts of racialized planning of the early 20th century as it plays out in Greensboro. Uh, population in poverty. We see that the map of poverty is very similar to the map of color in Greensboro. East, south, southeast Greensboro having higher rates of poverty. In fact, we'll look at just a few neighborhoods where poverty is in excess of 40% and as high as 70 or 80% in some neighborhoods. These neighborhoods are East Bessemer and Summit Avenue, just north of NCANT, uh, east of ANT, Bessemer neighborhood, the Cottage Grove neighborhood, the Willow Oaks neighborhood, which was redeveloped earlier in the 2000s under the Hope Six uh, program, where they took Morningside homes and raised them, a, a 500 unit complex of public housing, replacing them with mixed use owner occupied and rental homes uh, in that neighborhood. Nacho Park, or Nacho Park, um, which is just south of ANT, a lot of student housing there, uh, more recently acquired by ANT. Uh, South of town, we have the Warnersville neighborhood, Prince of Peace in that area, Smith Homes, the other large um, uh, 1950s public housing uh, complex um, that was built and is currently undergoing what's called RAD conversion, which will uh, turn it into uh, um, a managed section eight um, uh, uh, apartment complex, and then Oak Grove. Parts of the Glenwood neighborhood, uh, the south portion towards Freeman Mill Road. I'll note that that north portion that is, I'm gonna highlight it here. This north portion right here is kind of an anomaly. This is now student housing. Uh, this is uh, Spartan Village. Uh, essentially, a studentification has occurred here where we've uh, torn out about a thousand affordable uh, units um, and, and replaced them with uh, student housing. Hillsdale Park, uh, further east out towards Merritt and South Holden, just south of Smith High School, um, a number of condos and apartment complexes out there um, that are um, lower income. Finally, UNCG, again, another anomaly here, uh, wherever you have uh, students who are only part-time employed or unemployed, uh, it inflates the poverty statistics. Areas where poverty is persistent though, we see more uh, in, in those East Greensboro neighborhoods. Um, these are neighborhoods where we see the percentage of people living in poverty is over 20% for the past three decades. What is the impact of this? Low access to healthcare. Um, these are areas um, that are uh, designated as uh, medically underserved areas um, by the health uh, DHHS. Um, these same neighborhoods uh, have very few dental offices, very few vision clinics, very few primary care providers. Uh, uh, there are only two or three um, uh, primary care providers in this, in this area uh, and do not have access to um, uh, healthcare on a regular basis. These are the areas designated by the USDA as being low income and low food access or just low income, uh, low food access and low transportation access. Um, uh, those are overlapping areas. Uh, many people refer to these as food deserts. Um, if you have low transportation access, more than a quarter of the population not having a, a, a vehicle, uh, with 40% of the population having low income uh, uh, and no uh, supermarket within a, a mile radius, uh, then you're experiencing difficulty in accessing food uh, that is healthy uh, on a regular basis. 
these same neighborhoods that we've indicated um, have also been identified by various means as having uh, low quality of housing. This is not that the housing is uh, was poor when it was built in the 1920s or 1940s or 1970s, but that it has been poorly maintained over time. Um, in the first uh, map on the left, uh, the Center for Housing Community Studies uh, conducted a parcel level review. And this is the um, uh, index, uh, the summative index of all of our measures. We've broken out some of the measures there uh, to the right, uh, houses with poor roof conditions only, or houses with ba bad foundations. Uh, but we've also matched this data against local code enforcement uh, information and see that the patterns um, are sustained. The same neighborhoods where rental rates are high, where poverty is high, have poor quality or substandard uh, housing conditions. These poor housing conditions, these medically underserved neighborhoods, uh, these high poverty areas also have poor health outcomes. Uh, these are correlated factors, um, uh, but um, seem to hold up when done in regression analyses as also causal. This, for example, is admissions to uh, Cone Hospital Emergency Department uh, or clinics during the fourth quarter of 2016. Um, and the areas correlated with um, uh, poor quality housing. Um, we ran regressions looking at uh, uh, housing quality uh, while accounting for educational attainment, home ownership, uh, income statuses of households, and found that um, uh, housing quality was a significant um, uh, predictor of uh, asthma admissions rates. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the other affordable housing issues, specifically as it relates to renters in these neighborhoods and the squeeze that they're experiencing or the cost burden. If it will go to the next one. I'm stuck on pin. There we go. So one of the impacts of the recession between 2009 and 2013 was a displacement by foreclosure of those who had entered the housing market later. So if you bought a house in the 80s, 90s, or 2000s, um, uh, you were uh, more likely to be foreclosed on during that, the recession uh, than those who had bought uh, in previous decades. More importantly, if you had bought since 2000, uh, you might have been a victim of uh, predatory lending, of uh, subprime lending rates, of uh, uh, issues with uh, um, over-purchasing for incomes, uh, and uh, that segment of the population was very precarious um, and, and highly likely to be foreclosed on. Um, we moved from about 45% renter households to 51% uh, households in Greensboro during that time. And this is the most uh, uh, recent figure, 51.3% or 63,000 households in Greensboro renters. We see that you're more likely to be a renter in East and Southeast Greensboro, but also out uh, I-40 uh, as we've had expansion along that, that area, the neighborhoods uh, west um, uh, um, along that route between Market and 40, uh, where new apartment complexes and new developments have occurred there. Rents are highest though, along that corridor that I was just mentioning. Um, uh, friendly and market areas out towards um, uh, Guilford College, uh, rents are in excess of $1,000 a month for two bedroom houses. Rents are still fairly affordable as an overall affordability, in East Greensboro, South Greensboro. Rents are highest in, in the areas where there's the lowest availability of rental housing and the highest availability of um, uh, home ownership. Rents on average in Greensboro, um, uh, around $850 um, uh, gross. That 
rent has been steadily increasing between 2012 and 2020, about a 59% increase. So in eight years, um, uh, rents have gone up 59%. Incomes have not followed. Uh, incomes have, have not kept pace uh, with the increases in rent. That has resulted in a higher and higher percentage each year of residents experiencing a status called cost burden. Cost burden means they're spending more than 30% of their uh, gross income on housing and housing related expenses. That's about 48% of all renters are cost burdens, half of renters, uh, and about 24% of homeowners. Uh, and among homeowners, we see that those who are elderly <coughs> are more likely to be cost burdened than those who are younger uh, owners. Um, one of the impacts of being cost burdened is that um, uh, you are more precariously housed than others. Uh, you're more at risk of eviction uh, than others may be. Uh, we've seen our eviction rates in uh, Greensboro um, being some of the highest in the nation. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, currently, 2019, the best data that we have from the AOC, the uh, administration of the court, is that there were 11,000 evictions filed in Guilford County in 2019, and about 80% of that is uh, Greensboro. 11,000 filed, about uh, half of those result in what's called a writ of possession. This is when the sheriff comes and padlocks uh, and moves out um, uh, a renter. In between the summary ejectment filing, the eviction filing, and the writ of possession, some people are able to uh, pay the landlord and preserve their tenancy. Um, uh, some people end up moving out um, uh, without there being a, a final writ of possession ordered. Um, uh, so, so there, there's a, a variety of outcomes there. So, so between five and 6,000 um, uh, uh, ind individual households are evicted annually um, uh, currently. That rate was just a bit higher in 2016 when we saw 16,000 summary ejectments um, uh, during that year. Uh, we were seventh in the country uh, for uh, eviction rates according to um, uh, Princeton's eviction lab. Uh, if you've read the book Evicted uh, by Matthew Desmond, uh, uh, Desmond uh, became the PI on a project called the Eviction Lab at Princeton, which is now uh, uh, accumulating data from across the country on eviction rates. We were number one in the state of North Carolina in our eviction rate per renter households of uh, mid and large size cities. About 14 evictions daily in 2016 and holding just a little bit below that now. This is a map of evictions in Greensboro. We see that uh, evictions were disproportionately in South and Southeast Greensboro in many of those same neighborhoods where we saw, saw high rates of um, uh, poverty, high rates of food insecurity, medically underserved neighborhoods, um, asthma rates, et cetera. Let's turn just a little bit to environmental justice issues. We're going to talk a little bit about toxic and marginal lands and how this relates to housing environments. This is from that redlining map. Um, and I've circled the neighborhood, which is Cottage Grove today. And there's a, a dot on this map that is very significant to us right here. This little dot right here. It's hard to read, but it says incinerator. And just north of it, it says cemetery. This area right here is what we're concerned with in 1937. This is from the Greensboro Patriot, 1922. The city of Greensboro is trying to figure out where to put an incinerator and landfill. That was the incinerator we saw in 1937. In the end, they had purchased 10 acres 
from an African-American family. Uh, Walter Huffman was the name, but it was the Huffman, um, Huffman Sykes family. Um, and it was actually more than one owner. There, there um, Many uh, properties at this time were passing uh, through air rights, um, um, H-E-I-R rights, um, rather than uh, deeds registered um, with the county. Uh, Walter Huffman and the Sykes family uh, owned this 10 acre uh, part of a farm in East, outside of East Greensboro. Uh, you can see that there, were, there was resistance indignant over incinerator site. Citizens of South Greensboro draw up a resolution opposing the incinerator on the South Buffalo uh, Creek. Um, nonetheless, the city was able to purchase this land um, and uh, establish an incinerator for wastes from uh, the white parts, the west and north parts of Greensboro, uh, to be trucked out uh, East Market, uh, burned and then dumped uh, in this lot just south of uh, what was an African American cemetery and what was uh, at that time uh, a, a small community um, of African Americans. And it's still wanting to draw. There we go. So here's that red line map overlaying another map of the neighborhood of Cottage Grove. And if it lets me disappear that, we see the Cottage Gardens Apartments Complex, which is uh, the new name for the Avalon Trace Apartments that were built first in 1959. We see New Hope Development Corporation, uh, which is a, a, a community organization associated with New Hope Baptist Church that's trying to um, uh, develop um, areas with affordable housing. We see Apache Street Park, we see Bingham Park, and we see Hampton, uh, the, the site of the former Hampton Elementary School that was um, uh, uh, rendered unusable in 2018, April, uh, due to a tornado. Um, what we don't see is the fact that this park right here is where the incinerator and landfill were. It is bifurcated by a tributary of the South Buffalo Creek. That creek passes under what is English Street and over by Hampton Elementary School. The landfill actually extended east along uh, Hampton's land. Um, and then um, the, the creek continues on until it, it meets up with uh, uh, the Buffalo and then finally the PD. So this is about a 10 acre, uh, 12 acre uh, parcel, Bingham Park, and about a 16 acre uh, where Hampton Elementary um, uh, stands, um, now vacant. Along that um, north tributary, um, we see a, a small uh, creek that um, on any given day has about 20 shopping carts and um, uh, refuse in it. Um, this is behind the Cottage Gardens apartments, um, blocking the flow um, and uh, 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 causing some, some environmental issues uh, to, to the quality of that creek. Moreover, I'm gonna jump just ahead here a second and then jump back. This is what we see along uh, the creek bed that uh, cuts through where the landfill used to be. We see that the creek actually is eroding the materials that were buried uh, in between 1923 and 1953, 1925 and 1953 uh, in the incinerator and landfill uh, area. Jump back just a moment here. Um, so there have been a series of EPA brownfield studies, two phases uh, by City of Greensboro, and now three phases of NCDEQ studies of the um, soil and water conditions uh, in this um, uh, former landfill, now park. Um, they have found uh, arsenic, iron, lead, manganese, um, as well as volatile and semi-volatile organic compounds, uh, 
uh, coming from uh, the buried landfill and in the stream bed. Um, the pink squares are parcels, and on those parcels are people. People live right next to, and in some cases, right on top of the landfill. Kids play in this creek. Um, we have oral histories uh, from uh, members of the community in their 80s who talked about playing in the creek, uh, catching crayfish and eating blackberries on, uh, that, that grew along the creek banks. At Hampton Elementary School, um, where lead and manganese and other heavy metals have been found, there was a playground, a baseball diamond. Uh, um, and uh, every day, many of the families who lived uh, in this section of, of uh, Cottage Grove would walk across the creek, bouncing on uh, rocks to get to the school. So lots of interaction. This is from NCDEQ's um, mapping system, and we see a designation for pre-regulatory landfill site, as well as some other EPA concerns uh, in the neighborhood. These are disproportionately in neighborhoods of color when we map them across the state and across our own city. Here's another aerial view and you can see uh, where the creek bed lies, where the boundary in red of the former uh, landfill uh, is, uh, where it extends over onto um, the land uh, that Hampton occupied. So what are some of the potential health impacts? Well, we know that um, these substances, lead and other heavy metals, have been um, uh, associated with asthma, reproductive issues, uh, birth issues, cancers, thyroid issues, um, immunotoxicity, uh, uh, Etc. cetera, um, uh, multiple sclero sclero sclerosis, sorry, Alzheimer's, uh, uh, brain necrosis, death uh, have all been correlated. So this is the lay of the land. This is the social and environmental justice issue uh, that uh, we are trying to address. And now I'm gonna talk about five uh, projects um, that uh, UNCG Center for Housing and Community Studies is involved in as a partner um, uh, with community uh, to address some of these issues. First, let's talk about housing quality and its correlation with uh, respiratory illnesses, in particular pediatric asthma. Under the Invest Health Initiative funded by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Reinvestment Fund through two rounds, six years now, We've been working in partnership with the City of Greensboro Neighborhood Development, East Greensboro Now, a community development organization, um, Cone Health and, and its uh, community outreach, um, forgetting a partner, and the Greensboro Housing Coalition, um, five key partners in addressing the conditions that exacerbate asthma. We're in fact number three in the country uh, uh, in uh, 2019 for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation for asthma uh, issues, uh, quality of uh, air, um, uh, flora and fauna that contribute to asthma conditions. But the underlying issues are uh, medical, access to medical care, high poverty, and quality of housing. By combining uh, the different studies we've conducted over the years, respiratory related admissions to the hospital, uh, quality of housing studies, we were able to actually uh, target specific neighborhoods and eventually specific uh, apartment complexes that were contributing to the disproportionate numbers of uh, emergency department visits. Here, for example, is Avalon Trace prior to its purchase and conversion by an East Durham uh, developer. It was a 176 unit complex, which by this time, 50 units had been condemned. Um, it had over 120 annualized visits to Cone 
uh, hospital uh, for respiratory related issues, 30, more than 30 of those being pediatric uh, asthma cases. After we were able to help uh, uh, the East Durham, um, first to get the property on the market and then the East Durham developer uh, to purchase the, the property, we assisted in uh, uh, getting a bridge loan that allowed them to invest almost $2 million in rehabbing uh, the property. Another uh, half million dollars from the city of Greensboro in a, a no interest loan uh, to conduct weatherization work. This did not take a, a um, poor quality, um, what we call a D minus or, or, or lower property and turn it into a luxury apartment complex. But it did solve the issue of uh, people needing literally a blow up swimming pool in their living room whenever it rained. And, and that, that is a, a, a true situation. Several people in the apartment complex would set up swimming pools and buckets for when it would rain. It did solve the issue that when um, uh, residents flush their toilet, the uh, sewer would come back out of their bathtub. Uh, it has uh, uh, removed uh, carpeting as much as 20 years old, uh, replacing it with slick laminate floors, upgrading HVAC systems, replacing windows with windows that actually closed and sealed, putting door seals in, painting interiors and exteriors. It is still a work in progress. Uh, now even two years out, um, uh, still an ongoing um, uh, process. But according to new data from Cone Health, um, I saw that Meredith is, is on our call. Uh, Meredith has been working with us on this. Um, according to new data from Cone Health, uh, we see a reduction in the number of visits to the hospital um, from uh, residents at uh, the apartment complex even as the apartment complex has more units now available, all 176 are occupied and more uh, families living there. Uh, so good measures of uh, outcomes. Uh, UNCG's Center for Housing Community Studies also has a resource center in one of the apartment uh, units there. Uh, we provide uh, snacks and food uh, from Backpack Begin Beginnings and Out of the Garden Project. Uh, we have a, a project with UNCG psychology department, Strong Minds, Strong Communities, uh, providing mental health uh, care access. There's a nursing clinic on Thursdays for, uh, with uh, students from UNCG's nursing department. We just received a Dollar General Literacy uh, Award, uh, which is providing 10 uh, Kindle Fire Kids editions uh, with um, libraries of more than 20,000 books. Uh, scholastic readers uh, weekly uh, and uh, about 400 new books for our lending library, as well as uh, Dibble's assessments that we're doing pre and post to um, uh, see increases in reading scores. We're matching UNCG, ANT, Bennett, and Guilford College students uh, and volunteers from the community as reading pals with uh, 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 resident uh, children in the neighborhood even virtually uh, during COVID, um, they've been able to do read aloud times um, uh, through Zoom. We have a health impact team that was born out of the Invest Health Initiative and all of the mapping that we've done, where we're using federal work study students, um, a team of 20 who've been trained uh, in community engagement, in door-to-door -door canvassing and conducting quick screeners uh, two to three minute questionnaires at the door, which indicate um, if there are respiratory illnesses, if they're, um, they meet the qualifications for lead safe uh, housing screening or for weatherization. Um, this is up to $60,000 in community resources that could go to rehabbing renter or homeowner occupied uh, housing. In High Point, we've just extended this project uh, uh, to include High Point and through the Foundation for Healthy High Point, we also have $500 uh, for um, some homes uh, for minor remediation work to make sure that they are eligible for uh, weatherization and um, lead safe housing. Um, 
see if I can get my skull there. Um, this is one of those programs where we don't stop with a referral, but every 30, 60, 90 days, we call back and follow up and we triage cases to make sure that we're able to get as many resources as possible uh, to the residents that qualify. Often we're finding that there's a marketing gap between what federal and state and local resources are available and what people know about. Um, if lead safe housing at the city of Greensboro is not going out into the neighborhoods, neighborhood residents aren't gonna find out about it. Um, if it's just on their website or just in a newspaper article once every six or eight months. So by going out and knocking on doors, we're increasing the number of people who are being referred to and applying to these programs. And then we're helping them navigate um, the process of getting those resources. Here's one example case. Um, we knocked on the, on the door of uh, Miss Mary uh, on Gorell Street in East uh, Greensboro. Uh, you can note from this uh, Google Street View that she had some roofing issues that were quite apparent. Um, we also found out that she did not have heat uh, for uh, several years. Um, because of the roofing issues and the heat, her house would have been condemned if we referred her for assistance in the city of Greensboro. Because of the roofing issues, um, the weatherization program couldn't fix her house. Um, they had funds to replace the heating system. We had to help um, get uh, the housing coalition and a, uh, a local builder to uh, replace the roof uh, as a uh, donated uh, activity, a little bit of publicity on, on TV8 from it. Um, and as a result, she was then able to get through weatherization, new heat, some plumbing fixed, a ceiling fixed, uh, and then some uh, weatherization to windows, doors, um, uh, vapor barrier under the house and blown insulation uh, uh, in the attic. Uh, all things that she would have qualified for um, if she had known about, but didn't know about until we knocked on the door. With those who are facing eviction, we're working with the Greensboro Housing Coalition with assistance from uh, the Community Foundation and the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation uh, to provide eviction resolution. Uh, this has become kind of supercharged under COVID as uh, some CARES Act funding has also flown, uh, flowed to this program. This program uh, uh, gets referrals from a variety of resources to Greensboro Housing Coalition an if-then scenario uh, algorithm uh, is used to determine if they're eligible for eviction resolution. They're then matched with uh, legal aid case uh, workers who review the case to make sure that we negotiate well for terms, for paying back uh, uh, back rent, for making sure that um, the uh, housing is good quality. They receive emergency rental assistance um, uh, from GHC, uh, who then uh, continues to follow up with them for 30, 60, 90 days. And at this point, uh, CHCS is providing uh, evaluation and technical assistance uh, to this program that we set up. Uh, this really resulted out of uh, about three and a half years of studying eviction resolution pro projects across the uh, United States, as well as um, uh, collecting local data on eviction. A new project that starts with a pilot of five cases in December, 20 cases in January, and then um, up to 100 cases thereafter is a mediation program, which will bring in uh, pro bono lawyers, um, uh, students in mediation and peace and conflict studies, uh, Elon Law um, students to, to act as mediators um, between landlords and renters. Uh, it will work with the eviction resolution project and uh, legal aid and Greensboro Housing Coalition, but also with um, many other referral agencies. In fact, they're meeting right now uh, discussing uh, uh, tenancy protections, Urban Ministry, Salvation Army, Welfare Reform, City of Greensboro, Faith Action, et cetera. Another spinoff out of this has been the Tenant Leadership Academy and getting in front of the issue of uh, eviction 
uh, we decided that we need to have on the ground grassroots leaders within low income apartment communities, uh, within public housing, within Section 8 housing. So with a grant from the Ford Foundation, uh, we ran three uh, cohorts of uh, the Leadership Academy. Um, they received 25 hours worth of uh, training around uh, how to organize, how to create a, a, an action plan, how to create a vision for their apartment community, uh, how to get an apartment association uh, together uh, in uh, their uh, apartment communities. Um, we're hoping to continue following up with this in the future with additional uh, cohorts of the Leadership Academy, as well as um, uh, providing technical assistance and follow-up to each of those um, uh, uh, groups that have been formed. Turning now to environmental issues, um, we know that housing is a container uh, that impacts individuals' health, but we also need to address the issues at the neighborhood level of the environmental quality. First was the Water Resources Research Institute project um, to address issues of the creek water quality. We've collected environmental and oral histories of the neighborhood, documented through um, newspapers and uh, uh, county documents, city documents, um, the history of uh, the landfill and the streams. We've done focus groups and charrettes with neighborhood members. We've engaged community cleanup days, which we're doing quarterly um, through the next two years. We've engaged with youth uh, around environmental literacy and environmental education and environmental justice issues, and we're monitoring water quality. Uh, researchers at AMT and in the geography department at UNCG have been assisting with this uh, project. Um, we're trying to remediate both the uh, um, conditions that are caused by residents today, as well as those historic conditions uh, from the past. These are some pictures from our, our last um, environmental cleanup day. We have another one coming up on December 5th, so if you'd like to volunteer, uh, please let me know. Finally, through the charrettes with community members, uh, we collected buckets of issues. We, we called this our bucket list. On the bucket list were questions about why res why, how and why residents uh, would want to engage with advocacy about environmental issues. Why, why should people be concerned? Um, questions about what are the damages to the water, soil, and land as a result of um, having a, a buried landfill in their neighborhood. Questions about the impact of the landfill on human health. Um, uh, there's a lot of worry and concern in the neighborhood about the physical and mental health impacts of having contamination nearby. While NCDEQ says none of the contaminants are impacting uh, health today, uh, there's still a lot of fear and concern and, and uh, questioning skepticism about um, that. And finally, there are questions by the community uh, around the, uh, the proposed strategy from the Department of Environmental Quality to uh, cap uh, via a, a, a plastic mesh um, the, the remained, remaining uh, contaminants and not remediate them, not, not uh, dig them out and, and haul them off. Um, this is not trusted right now um, by the community residents. So there's lots of questions around that. These questions led us to um, our Interdisciplinary Research Leaders Program uh, Award uh, from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, $350,000 award and, and three years with Sandra Echeverria in public health here at UNCG, uh, Kathy Colville at Cone Health and myself uh, working beside community members to address these four buckets of issues. Um, so through our project, we will look at medical records, death records, and see the associated impacts once geographically mapped, if there's a spatial uh, 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 correlation with proximity to the park, landfill, or stream with health outcomes that we know could be correlated with the contaminants that are in the park. We're looking at um, the effectiveness of 
uh, an environmental justice um, uh, campaign to raise awareness and raise voice uh, within the community. And uh, we wanna see that the community concerns uh, and voices are heard by uh, NCDEQ in the way that they choose to address both the Bingham Park land and more importantly, the Hampton Elementary land. Um, together, that's more than 26 acres right in the heart of the neighborhood. Uh, the park and the school that had acted as central convening points um, that are sitting on top of lead, manganese, and other uh, heavy metals and need to be addressed. So what are the key takeaways here? Um, principally that these racially biased policies of the previous century have created segregated communities where people of color live on sometimes marginal or even toxic lands in neighborhoods where wealth and equity have systematically been mined from their families for decades. We need policies and practices that will push capital and resources into these distressed areas to address social and economic issues, not just to build our way out, that's how we end up with gentrification, but to redevelop the communities that uh, have been impacted by these policies. And I argue that in the meantime, it's the place of the university, the healthcare system, advocate, advocacy organizations and residents to co-collaborate, co-investigate, uh, uh, work together to directly improve housing conditions and environmental quality, and to put pressure on policymakers to address these issues. And I haven't seen if there are any questions in the in the chat box. There we go. Thank you, Stephen. That's. Uh, I'll give you a second to get some water <laughs> and uh, catch your breath. There. That was. I uh, just want to commend your work. Um, that you and your colleagues, uh, some of whom are on this call, and um, that of the invested members of the community. It's, it's a sad history, but I think it, it's a hopeful future that you're working towards. And um, yeah, really insightful. Uh, learned a ton in this talk, really appreciate it. Um, I do see, well, or, yes, we've record, Stephen to give us permission to record it. We will put the uh, video on YouTube and we're actually building a web page for the, um, previous talks that we've ha held so far. Um, you guys are welcome to unmute yourselves now if you wanna um, uh, you know, turn, off, turn your cameras on and, and ask some questions personally of, of Dr. Sills. Um, you know, uh, <clears throat> Stephen, the one thing that I thought of while you were talking was you know, what resources are available through the, um, the Center for Housing and Community Studies or other resources like DEQ's mapping website that would be of use to um, community members. If we could, you know, if I email folks and I could put links to those or something in the email. Certainly, yeah. Um, we have accumulated um, literally thousands of data points for Guilford County uh, on, on a number of projects, most uh, with, with geospatial information. Um, uh, we have a, a strong GIS unit, strong evaluation and data unit um, uh, with, uh, there are four PhDs and four master's uh, folks working uh, on these issues. Um, we also provide technical assistance to community organizations. Um, I've uh, regularly uh, collaborated with neighborhood associations and, and other organizations that are looking at uh, very location specific information. And, and so we've helped provide that or technical assistance around housing and neighborhood uh, development issues. And we're, we're building that even more. I will um, put a link to the website in the uh, chat for everybody. Yeah. The other question I, ha I had, and I can't remember the name of the um, apartment complex that you highlighted where there was the over 50 condemned apartments in there, but um, what, what, how is the, uh, is it under the same ownership? I mean, yeah, so what are the re repercussions for landlords like this? Uh, unfortunately, very few repercussions. So this goes back about 15, 12 to 15 years ago to uh, a group called Shannon Enterprises that owned 
five or six apartment communities across the city that were very similar to this. Legacy Crossing is one of them. Um, uh, there's one on South Holden, um, uh, South Point uh, apartment complex that you may have read about uh, recently uh, in the news. Um, Shannon sold these as a, as a portfolio uh, to an out-of-state company in Georgia uh, that, that simply took all the cash flow and didn't reinvest anything uh, in the complexes. Um, uh, we, we, we call this equity mining, uh, and there are many companies that do this. They, they just um, they, they take, 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 and don't, don't reinvest. In the end, uh, because of the public shaming that Greensboro Housing Coalition was able to do, the data was able to, to provide, um, the neighborhood residents organized uh, uh, with um, uh, Josie Williams at the Housing Coalition. Um, uh, those voices and that data were able to force the previous owner from Georgia to, to put the apartment complex on the market. Um, you know, being in the newspaper every other day for how bad your apartments are motivates one to, to, to sell. Um, uh, the new owner, uh, Carolina Community Investments, um, uh, has done a, a, a phenomenal job, though it's a very difficult job. Um, the, the older part of this were built barrack style, concrete slab, uh, cinder block um, structure, uh, very rudimentary and very hard to, to really update. Um, uh, she's made it livable, but it, it still has constant issues. Um, uh, part of it has been, how do you do that and not raise rents? Um, most most places people would come in, raise the rent and then, or improve it and then raise the rent uh, to pay for it. Um, and this has been uh, a, a, a delicate balance, um, how, how to improve the quality without uh, raising the rents. Uh, it has been since renamed now Cottage Gardens. Um, so this is an issue that repeatedly comes up in sustainability research as well as far as, you know, um, absentee landlords, particularly in, in um, single family housing where we're, um, the their in ineptitude and their um, blind eye to the maintenance of their houses is those expenses are passed on to uh, the renters. And I can speak from experience, you know, we've got a 20 year old air conditioner that um, cost us an arm and a leg in, in the summer. But if they had just, you know, if they were, there's some sort of policy or law that would hold them to, you know, maintaining those types of um, that type of infra infrastructure, we'd be saving a lot of money, reducing our carbon footprint, um, all kinds of stuff and health hazards and all, all of that. We do have a, a couple questions um, about where people can go to volunteer. Just dropped it in the chat, um, go.uncg.edu forward slash Buffalo cleanup. And that will take you to our Eventbrite site um, to, to sign up. We are limiting the, the, the numbers uh, due to COVID. Um, we do, we pass out masks and gloves. Uh, we meet outside of the apartment complex. Um, and then uh, uh, there's a little bit of instruction and all that goes on. And then we assign uh, a segment of the creek to work on. Great, thank you. And Stephen, following up on that, uh, if anyone is interested in volunteering with your center, would, um, do they contact you or? Yes, they can send me an email at chcs at uncg.edu, um, and then I'll refer them uh, either to, uh, if they're interested in the Cottage Gardens Resource Center volunteering, I'll refer them to Tierra Brown, uh, Tierra Brown, who's in charge of that, or to the Health Impact Team, and then Atija Farmer, who's in charge of that. So. That's great. Are there uh, any last questions or, or comments from anyone? I see that a lot of people found this very extremely informative. So thank you so much. I will uh, send an email to everybody um, once we get the uh, video up on YouTube and um, you'll, you can also watch the other ones that we've had. And this will be our last event this uh, semester, but we are planning on having more 
uh, presentations and, and discussions in the spring. So uh, again, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Kenafuchi for helping organize this and many, many thanks to Dr. Stephen Stills at UNCG's Center for Housing and Community Studies for joining us today. We really appreciate it, Stephen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And many thanks to everyone for joining us. Y'all take care and be safe out there.